and this is this was a huge discovery for me personally when I realized that this may actually be an interesting way, I'm not saying the only way, but interest, an interesting way of reading an activism mm -hmm. as a proposition according to which we should right now try a different ontology of cognition. An ontology that is not based on the internal versus external dichotomy, but on something else. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Dr. Conrad Werner. Uh, Conrad is currently at the Faculty of Philosophy, University of Warsaw. His areas of interest include the philosophy of perception, which is an area where I believe you started in philosophy of perception initially, and uh, philosophy of mind, an active embodied cognition, to more recently, a uh, theory of institutions, applied ontology, and meta philosophy. He's the author of, among many articles, he has also written a book titled The Embodied Philosopher, Living in Pursuit of Boundary Questions, published by Palgrave Macmillan, and in the process of publishing a second book in English, a third book in total. I think you have a, a book in Polish. Um, yeah. That book, I believe, is, uh, I forgot the name of it, but uh, maybe you can remind me. The title of well, the third book should be published. I, well, let's say I hope it will be published this year or next year. It's not that easy to 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 find a publisher, but the title is quite fun. I I, I believe it's the footprint footprint of mind. Footprint of mind. Uh, yeah. At least the provisional title, is the footprint yes. of mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so thank you very much for in accepting my invitation, Conrad. That's uh, my pleasure. I, I've been looking forward to speaking with you. Um, let's if you if you if you would let's begin with general your general scholarly path so far how did you start with philosophy and metaphysics in particular this concern with metaphysical questions and how did you become interested in the you know embodied and, and active the so-called 4e cognitive science well uh, i don't know where to start so perhaps the most general answer to that question is well when it comes to the question of how i ended up in philosophy as such uh first and then uh in the field of um, an activism and applied ontology so i guess that becoming a philosopher was an answer i i, I don't claim that this is the only answer but an answer to the question of how to uh come up with a solution let's say a life solution when one part of you wants to become a paleontologist and the other part of you want to wants to become a cartoonist <laughs> so this is basically my this is basically my story i would say because uh, i i belong to this generation we we started our actual growing up mm -hmm. so we became teenagers when jurassic park premiered so we were all interested in dinosaurs but i guess that i i took it a little bit deeper and so i learned a great deal about about natural history and at some point i realized that this is actually a certain story to have much more than just data because the data is very scattered very selected so that's why you need a narrative you need a story on the other hand, uh, on the cartoonist side as well, I was very much interested in movies and, and, and I wanted to become the next Walt Disney or Tex Avery for anyone who knows who Tex Avery was. So I wanted to be the next Tex Avery in, in, in the field of animation. And this is also about stories. So that's why I realized that at some point I'm interested in creating narratives. And the biggest narrative that you can have is provided by philosophy. So uh, that's why it's so dangerous because you can make this great leap, this big leap from scattered data to the biggest narrative that you can ever think of. And this is a very dangerous thing. And philosophy basically does this thing. And that's why sometimes you can, you can fall into some sort of abyss uh, uh which means nonsense 
basically. And this is the, the Wittgensteinian threat mm -hmm. that uh, sooner or later you will end up with some sort of nonsense. So it's a dangerous thing to be a philosopher, but still um, I decided to, at some point I decided to to make this big leap. And that's why I, I started to uh, study philosophy, aside from many other inspirations like uh, my home environment and so on. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to my, let's say, professional interests, there is a very specific environment in Poland in particular. So on the one hand, you have Polish logic, which is well known. So formal analysis. Uh, while on the other hand, you have a quite strong phenomenological tradition based mostly on Roman Ingarden, who was one of, uh, I believe, Husserl's closest uh, students. So uh, Husserl respected him very much. So you have these two branches, let's say, and what what was produced by these two branches is ontology, formal ontology, because in garden on the one hand and, and formal uh, apparatus on the other, and you have uh, uh, many people working in, in uh, formal ontology in Poland. So we are quite good at it. And my actually, I was supposed to, to cover certain things having to do with formal ontology of location and which is based on meteorology, which is uh, which is uh, the formal theory of uh, parts, 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 and, parts and rather parts than holes. But uh, meteorotopology, so-called meteorotopology, is is the proper theory of parts and holes. Okay. So, but it's a subtle difference, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this was my uh, my first idea. I. Um, started my PhD studies with my with a great philosopher Jerzy Perzanowski, who was great, uh, really great a formal ontologist. But he passed away after just one year of our collaboration. And I ended up in, uh, well, there, there were certain things uh, uh, along the way, but I ended up in, 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 in the cognitive science department at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. And so and I had to do something with my so-called career and with my life. And um, finally, my PhD was in in the philosophy of perception. It was about so-called aspectual shape of perception, which means that well, basically the idea is that we perceive just certain aspects of things. And now the question is, what are these aspects? Are they in our heads or are they in the world? Well, they are relative to our perception, so they cannot be in the world just like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but in some sense, they are perhaps if you want to remain uh, a realist, well, in, understood in one way or another. So I wanted to remain uh, uh, a realist. So that's why I wanted to provide a realist interpretation of perceptual aspects. So this is my PhD. And based on that, I got interested in embodied cognition and in activism because what they actually uh, propose when it comes to perception and cognition in general is this relative character of what we see as our world, that it depends on how we perceive it, how we think of it, from what angle we perceive it and so on and so forth so this was my entryway uh, to phenomenology and then uh, and then uh, an activism varela and body cognition more broadly but still this ontological interest was still in the back of my head so my project was to apply certain things i know from formal ontology in the field of embodied cognition and an activism. So I came up with this super strange idea of what I call ontological foundations of embodied cognition. Mm -hmm. And people generally react, uh, I mean, in various ways, but in most cases, they are terrified by the term itself. What do you mean by ontological foundations of embodied cognition? 
what could it be my gun and mm -hmm. so then i uh, in most cases i start to i start to explain what could what this thing could mean so mm -hmm. this is my this is my um i don't want to bore our listeners with all the details uh, along the way but long story not so short <laughs> this is this is my answer to your first question yeah yeah that's great that's great um i wanted to ask you about your you already touched on this your uh distinct style as you see it your particular uh style that is shaped by your history and also by your interests and concerns and you already said that you're you had this um historical root in uh, animation you, you're interested in animation and at the same time paleont paleontology and science and this, the synthesis between them was an interest in narratives and then uh, now more recently as i was listening to you there was also this quote unquote foundationalist tendency that the, the the move towards grounding grounding a, a, a project or a science uh, like embodied cognitive science um, I'm interested in now we can still stay with this, but I also want to hear your thoughts on what is it that makes a field, a discipline inhospitable to a contribution? Because this is something I think to some extent we share in common. I also try to ground experimental psychology in a kind of a very, very uh, simple form of phenomenology to show that to show a, a broader context of it and see that this to see the trace of decisions made by uh, scientists experimental psychologists that some of the decisions could be made otherwise that there's a lot of responsibility that they are not taking for the language and for the decision and for the way they talk about the results of their study so going back to your yeah, your story uh, i want to hear a little bit more about the interaction between your work, your contribution, and the broader field. Referring to this notion that people are not very welcoming when it comes to such foundational or grounding investigations, this is actually one of my fixations, let's say, one of my topics uh, recurring basically everywhere, namely problematization. You need to problematize certain things. And these most general concepts like categories and the concepts we we forge to represent or to somehow grasp the categories that we assume are somehow encrypted in reality let's say if we are realists in, in the platonic or aristotelian sense so these concepts there are supposed to represent the most general categories in the world are mostly transparent if you know what i mean they people don't pay attention to them simply because they are just tools that we use so naturally that you need an extra metacognitive effort to actually refocus your attention and pay attention to these very conceptual conditions of any reference is very Kantian what I'm saying right now but I believe it's much more general than just referring to Kant himself and his his critiques so it's difficult and perhaps even not that difficult because you know when you have to learn calculus it's it's more difficult but for some reason and uh, and perhaps you can tell me why as an experimental psychologist somehow it is i mean in practical terms difficult for uh, many people to refocus attention and to to focus on these usually transparent conceptual mm -hmm. tools so if if i ask myself why certain people are not are not too much willing let's say to do ontology in particular, but also epistemology and all these traditional philosophical grounding fields or pursuits, why are they, why they are not they are not interested? I mean, many people, not all, of course. Uh, this is the reason. This is the first thing that comes to my mind. 
when I am faced with this problem, that these general concepts are so transparent and so obvious in some sense that because of this fact that they are so natural in our uh, in our everyday life and also in doing science refocusing attention is just unnecessary there is actually no payoff in terms of your research from this refocus of attention mm -hmm. and, and in some sense it's true i mean you cannot have any extra empirical data because you what you what you problematize is the very condition of any empirical data so that's why it's not an empirical study anymore and now the question is how you can succeed mm -hmm. what are the criteria of success in this new endeavor and then you you discover that these criteria are completely different from the criteria of success mm -hmm applied uh, or employed in uh, in the empirical disciplines and now you are confused you don't know what to do <laughs> yeah, because yeah. actually your professional career depends on your success so i mean this is very practical i'm right now uh, entering a, a very very practical uh, um, consideration but still it matters i believe it matters to people to all of us it matters a lot so, yeah, this is, yeah, let's yeah. say, my initial speculation about this. Okay, great, great. Um, okay, that's a, that's a very exciting uh, topic. Uh, but let's continue. Maybe we'll return to that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have self-restraint. <laughs> <And talk, laughs> Me and too. I, yeah. My answers are too long. Yeah, no, 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 no. No, no, no. No, please, uh, your answers are perfect. Uh, let's, I, I want to ask you about this. I think it is related now that I'm thinking about it, the concept of cognitive niche or niche, uh, cognitive niche that um, I was introduced to in your work, and I believe it's a recurring theme. Um, could you tell us a little bit about cognitive niche and maybe we don't have to, but how like a cognitive niche could be disrupted by like what we, what you do as a, as a philosopher of science, you disrupt, you might, I'm, I mean, I'm just thinking about this possible description of disrupting the cognitive niche of uh, other researchers by problematizing <laughs> their uh, their way of relating to their niche, kind of destabilizing it, and they they get confused. And especially uh, in that process of going from one niche to another, that process of reconstruction, if they don't make it to the other side, that's that's the trouble. Um, but anyways, say it's, yeah. yeah, it's fascinating. I have never thought about my work about uh, the concept of cognitive niche as an exemplification of <laughs> cognitive niche disruption, mm -hmm. as you said. This is quite fascinating. I have to I actually I have to reflect on that a little bit more. I don't have any 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 ready made answer to that but i will perhaps i will somewhat speculate mm -hmm. about this thing because so when it comes to the very notion the mm -hmm. notion comes from uh it's in uh, i believe from 1988 paper by two anthropologists and psychologists to be and devore and they actually coined this term cognitive niche and then it would be years after it would be it would be taken up by uh, Steven Pinker and Andy Clark and, and and some other people. And right now the the term itself is getting traction, so to speak. Uh, by now, I mean in 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 recent years, it has been getting more and more traction. The general idea, at least from my perspective, is that. I guess that we should start from a, what a niche as such is. So a niche is, well, you can have at least two different ways of, of articulating the idea. So one of the ways is that organisms, including, including humans, of course, but generally organisms, reconstruct their surroundings. And this reconstruction 
of the surrounding of a particular creature becomes something more than just the world around the around this creature, but it becomes something as if serving the needs of this creature. And so it's by definition relative to the needs and capacities, including cognitive capacities of that creature uh, working as, as the niche constructor. Because I would say that, so in the literature, you have the niche literature and the niche construction literature, and they are not the same thing. But when it comes to the real substance, I believe this should be uh, one bag, so to speak. All oh, these people should be in one tent, a very big tent, but still. So niche and niche construction. So the basic idea is that organisms recreate their surroundings, and as a result of this constructive endeavor what what comes out of this const of this constructive endeavor is we could say uh, the world as serving the needs of specific organisms and now and this is one way of this constructivist approach let's say there is a more phenomenological reading of what a cognitive or the, in a niche as such is and here you can say that this is the world as perceived as seen or whatever cognitive capacity we'd like to take from the perspective of a particular creature. So this is my world, my Umwelt, as Jakob von Uxkul famously called it uh, more than 100 years ago. And now, if you have this very general notion of niche and niche construction, you can try to do something purely theoretical because uh, I mean, in, in the actual world, you, you cannot do this thing empirically, but you can conceptually single out or uh, distill, as in chemistry, the, 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 the cognitive aspect of it. So you put aside the, let's say, uh, metabolism related aspect of any niche. So the nutrients that you have in it, water and, and, and air pressure and everything. And you just focus on what is relative to your cognitive capacities. And if you do this thing conceptually, because as I said, it's, you cannot do this in, 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 in reality with some equipment in your hands. But if you do this thing conceptually, you end up with a cognitive niche. And now you can ask various questions about, about uh, for example, the metaphysical or ontological, these are two different related, related but still different things, but let's say metaphysical status of certain elements of your cognitive niche or any cognitive niche. You can ask about the ontological categories to which certain elements of the cognitive niche belong, like, for example, parts and holes and boundaries, and I'm especially interested in boundaries. You can even characterize the construction of a cognitive niche in terms of, as I put it, drawing boundaries, that actually the process by which you construct your cognitive niche or any living creature constructs its cognitive niche is like making distinctions, therefore, like drawing boundaries in the world, in your surroundings. So this is the general idea, let's say, what a cognitive niche is. And once we have this concept, it might be quite useful because many phenomena uh, can be approached as certain developments of the cognitive niche. And I am especially interested in uh, so to speak, social developments of our cognitive niches, how we create shared cognitive niches, how we, how we, uh, how it is possible in the most general sense of the term to coordinate our behaviors within our shared cognitive niche. And, uh, well, another question is whether we have just one or many cognitive niches. Are they individual specific or species specific? So many different questions. I mean, philosophical questions. 
how many questions you can ask, but this is the general idea. Ah, when it comes to this disruption, let's say, so when we have this social shared cognitive niche, there are certain rules, institutions, and they govern our behavior. They tell us, so to speak, they tell us what we can do and what we cannot do. And uh, what is especially interesting, and I even wrote a paper under this title, institutions within our cognitive niche decide who can ask what questions and who benefits from answering these questions. And this is closely related to your, to your fascinating remark about disrupting the cognitive niche. Because if you ask a question that you are not, so to speak, allowed to ask, or if you ask a question that for one way, uh, for one reason or another reason, somehow does not fit well with other questions or establish some established answers, then you can call it a disruption. Uh, but this is just my impromptu attempt to, let's say, articulate this idea of disruption as introduced by you to reformulate this idea uh, by means of my terminology, let's say. Mm -hmm. I think your descriptions already give us a lot of clues, especially when you said that when you introduce a new idea of scholarship, you are giving people a new definition of success, what it means to be successful in this type of scholarship that is not the same as what they already have in mind. And I guess an institution gives that to us too, like to, to be successful, it means that you have these, <laughs> you've met these criteria. So yeah, I, exactly. yeah, yeah. The, in general, cognitive niche, I also find it very generative and uh, as an organizing concept, it seems very, very uh, helpful. So, um, yeah. I uh, hope we, it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, moving on, I, I wanted to touch on this this historical autobiographical note too. I, I'm not sure if you remember this, but the first time I reached out to you was uh, seven years ago in 2017. Uh, I was uh, still, I, I still was in academia at the time. I was like growing my in my discomfort and discontent uh, before I finally decided to just uh, get out. <laughs> but at that time, I was actively looking for people that I could see as guideposts, people who are doing really good work. And one of the things that I read, uh, I was going through Constructivist Foundation Journal. I read your commentary, uh, which was titled A Presentation of the World, uh, Gibson and Husserl on the Interplay Between the Objective and the Subjective. It was a commentary on a target article about you know a reading a particular reading of Gibson that does away with mental representations or construction construction in uh, as as such, um, and I was really inspired by you know that in some sense when we see good scholarship it doesn't at in some sense it doesn't matter what the the particular topic is about because what captivates us is a for example a careful reading. Uh, phenomenological reading of Gibson, or on this on the other side, you can say a, an ecological reading of of Husserl, uh, and I think this careful reading is something that I, in general, love about philosophy. What draws me back again and again into philosophy? This is my very general question. Could you share with us some thoughts on this practice of reading? So, where this thing that I read, where does it come from? Uh, what criteria do we apply in our reading of and con comparing of various texts, various authors, various traditions? Oh, it's an extremely difficult question, I must say. Um, to begin with, I have to admit that I don't read as much as I should. <laughs> and this is very embarrassing. But, you know, sometimes I see on Twitter or X, as it is called right now, I see these posts with pictures of, oh, this is my 
pile of books. Uh, this is my reading list. And I mean, it's great. And I really believe that these people, some of whom I know, uh, and I know that most likely they actually did read these books or they actually will read these books or papers. And I'm really embarrassed because um, my reading routine is not even close to theirs. <laughs> so that's why it's an embarrassing question. But this is just um, just to begin with. So when it comes to this reading thing, let me begin from something that might be a detour. Uh, it might seem a detour, namely the importance of what we can call a canon. Right. Like a canon of books, the greatest novels of the 20th century or whatever. So this is my first thought because I've been thinking about this issue and I don't know to what extent it's actually related to your question, I'm afraid, but this is something I've been actively thinking about uh, for the last, I would even say a couple of years, because it, it is related to, um, perhaps surprisingly, to many things uh, I'm interested in, also professionally and not that professionally. So the thing is that when you have a canon like the greatest novels of the 20th century or something like that is always a decision and this decision always reflects a particular zeitgeist and it also reflects a particular uh, distribution of power in the world so like to give you just an example which is uh, especially uh, private from my perspective so you have like Dostoevsky or Tolstoy in basically any list, on basically any list of the greatest novels of all time, which is good because they were great writers. But I can give you some examples of uh, writers coming from Poland in the, from the 19th century or early 20th century uh, who were equally good, but they are not on that on these lists simply because my country was not powerful enough to put them there well it's a simplistic version of the story but more or less it's what it was any such canon is a political thing as well although i would not overemphasize it there are some people who would overemphasize these powers everything is about power so this is not what i'm trying to say what i'm trying to say is that all such canons are an issue and can be questioned, but still we need them. Right. So when I'm, when I'm going, uh, what I'm going to say is that right now we have, I mean, by we, I mean, at least I mean people living in Western countries, let's say. I don't know about uh, how it, uh, what the situation looks like in other uh, parts of the world, but at least when it comes to the so-called West, whatever that could mean, we have a problem because you have people who are completely, their minds are completely free of any canons. So right now, I believe there is no canon, and you have so many things you can read, you have so many things you can listen to when it comes to music, and basically everything, that it's easy uh, to get lost in this abundance of content. And now the question is how we can, if we can, regain the very notion of a canon and what should we put there? And so we, once again, we will face this political issue, but this is not something I'm uh, interested in but until we do this thing you need to make your own private decisions of what to read and what not to read what I'm interested in what I'm not in, not that much interested in and you are you are especially in trouble when you are interested in everything sure. so you just enter a bookstore and you would like to read everything because everything is from one point or another, it's interesting. And so now the question is what to do. And uh, 
my criteria, let's say, are strictly related to my philosophical interests, I'm afraid. So that's why, to some extent, perhaps I'm right now at the beginning of answering your question <laughs> when it comes to these criteria. So the importance of reading to me means the importance of reading as digging, let's say, reading as digging to the fundamental questions that are asked in a particular book, whether it is a book in philosophy or uh, in fiction or history or whatever, to dig into this level of the most fundamental, therefore conceptually the most abstract thing. So, for example, I read a novel and I'm interested in the philosophical content of this novel and I can I can't help doing that if I cannot find any philosophical content I don't mean professional philosophy but I mean certain topics right in the novel I am currently reading or something like that I lose interest and perhaps it's not good because there are many different levels psychological levels like purely psychological levels about human relationships, uh, love and hate and, and power and everything. This is all important, but you need to make your selections. You need to make your choices, especially if you're living through the times uh, uh, when you are completely, maybe not lost, but as I said at the very beginning, when you don't have these useful lists or canons or you distrust any such list so that's why it's not that obvious whether you should pick this list or that list uh, so you need to do your own choices so this is my way of, of of choosing things to read and it can be well anything it's what i'm trying to say is not that all you should read is some heavy you know big stuff stuffed with philosophical mm -hmm. dialogues and something like that no by no means this is what i mean but the, but but at least to me there must be something philosophical and now when it comes to this more academic context let's say because we started from gibson and huso i believe that gibson himself considered himself a phenomenologist to some extent so that's why this connection was not that was not uh, original at all, I believe. But uh, this is another thing that comes up when you ask yourself not only what to read, but how to read it. So this Husserl Gibson thing, even putting aside uh, the question of to what extent Gibson himself considered himself uh, a phenomenologist, it's about connecting. So reading as digging is one thing and connecting things is another thing like yes yesterday i i i um i read a novel and today i'm i'm reading something completely unrelated but somehow i managed to find a connection between these two things and at least my memory works in such a strange way that what i remember like a year from now is this connection and not all the details actually i have a terrible memory so i i'm sure that i will not remember all the details of the novel or all the details of this history book or whatever but i will remember the connection so right now if you ask me about certain things uh from gibson or from Husserl, i will be in serious trouble believe me because my memory, when it comes to all the details of Noima and 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 phenomenological reduction on the one hand, and and certain things having to do with ecological perception on the other, I will be in serious trouble. But what is still in my mind, and what steers my Wikipedia searches and this kind of stuff, my um, retraction of data from the internet, for example, or from from the books behind my back. What steers me is this connection I still can remember and 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 I can still have it uh, available in my own head, so to speak. I don't want to be too internalist, but let me let me still 
maintain uh, the belief that it's in my head. So since the connection is there, I can always quite quickly recall certain things from Husserl or from Gibson. So I believe that this is the importance of reading to me, and this is very subjective. I have no pretense in giving this particular answer in the sense that I don't claim it's objectively true. But my subjective perspective is that you know to do this reading as digging and reading as connecting things. And yeah, and this is what is left in my memory. The the abstract thing and the connecting thing is what is left in my memory. Everything else is, I'm afraid, uh, left blank because just of, of the mechanism of my poor memory. Wow, I'm I'm having too much fun. Uh, <laughs> what resonated with me when you were like, I think you did give me an answer, a very deep answer, but your answer was like. Okay, let me try to explicate what I what I understood, especially uh, with, regarding what you said about the canon. And this there's a paradox in canon, canonical works. And the paradox is that even though a canon is very impersonal, but to in, to engage with the canon, the process has to take us to a place where it becomes a very private and very personal thing. Yeah, and that's what. A, a contribution of a of a great thinker or a, a serious thinker is to personalize the canon, not just personalize the relationship to the canon, but actually give a new reading of the canon. And that's it. Also relates to something that I've with some of my friends we talk about this that to really reach a proper understanding of a book or a thinker, we get to a point where we can say we have placed. The, the thinker, we have placed the author. Like I understand Husserl, to the extent that I understand Husserl, I can also paraphrase that by saying that I've placed Husserl. And that can mean I've lost contact with lots of details, but I know roughly where a particular person stands in relation to others. And a good reading has something to do with that. So that's, that's I, I really appreciate that response that it's about placing in re with re uh, with um, in relation to a larger context of works, and without that, we are we we are lost. We might highlight different things, like a first year philosophy student might le read a, a thinker as like that's what you really <laughs> that's what you're paying attention to. So that's like without canon, it's uh it's very difficult. Um, in fact, we become more intelligent with that with the help of the canon. Anyways, did you want to add something to that? Yes, I mean, I just want to express the. I just want to express how I appreciate your uh, your understanding of of my answer in terms of this reading as locating, because right. this is really great. I mean, this is really what what I wanted to say to some extent, and this is really what I do in my reading. And especially with my poor memory, because, well, you know, there are people who rem remember everything. I know at least two or three such persons. They remember everything. Uh, but if you are not that kind of person, you need to focus on the logic, mm -hmm. so to speak, on the structure, on the structure of your thoughts, the structure emerging as a result, as a result of reading. And this means how these things are connected with one another. So here I have Husserl, and then I have Ingarden and Heidegger and Husserl. Oh, Husserl, okay, so Brentano, and and you have you have this whole context. And if you have it, if you have this map, you can quite easily, especially given uh, the technology that we have available right now, you can you can be really efficient in in retrieving information from various sources but you are you won't be efficient in doing that without this structural map if you know what i mean mm -hmm. actually i i'm sure you know what i mean because actually it's your idea so um so yeah i mean it's really something because 
for quite some time I've been looking for a right metaphor and this digging and connecting these are two different metaphors uh, trying to articulate one idea and now you have just given me another metaphor namely reading as locating and this is really great I have to I have to reflect on that it's interesting because, because I'm inspired by you in my choice of metaphor <laughs> by, <laughs> so, by your locative yeah. ontology <laughs> so, yes exactly it's very yeah. it's very related to that and so mm -hmm. uh, I mean I'm super happy that we we are having right now this mutual inspiration mechanism let's say mm -hmm. it's really great so but yeah I mean it's really good just today I read something in the newspaper that today I mean not today this year is the uh, the anniversary 100th anniversary of the publication of Thomas Mann's greatest novel I'm not sure to what what is the title in English, uh, the magical mountain or something. Magic is mountain. It, is magic Mag mountain. Yeah, you know, yeah. magical magic mountain. I read it in Polish, so that's why I was not sure about the English title. So there's 100 years from the publication of this book, and I read it when I was like 19 or 20 or something like that. The only thing I remember is that they were spending their time uh, in Davos. Uh, I mean the the characters in in the novel discussing various very strange political things and this was at the moment when the 19th century world was collapsing because of world war 1 and so it was on the brink of collapse actually the world that these people knew was on the brink of collapse. And now I can hardly recall any detail of the conversations. And I'm quite frustrated about it because I liked the novel, although I did not understand it perhaps properly given that I was just 19 back then, but still I can hardly recall any specific dialogue between these people, but I can locate this novel in the broader context of history, political history, the history of ideas, the history of philosophy. I know more or less what they were discussing, despite the fact that I, as I said, I, I, I cannot recall any detail. So this particular novel is placed on my structural map and I can always recall something. I can read it again. And this novel somehow still works in my mental map of the world, so to speak, despite the fact that all the details are gone, unfortunately. So this is really great. And actually, it even relates, I mean, this metaphor of locating, reading as locating, it, uh, as you can see, it's really... Uh, it resonates with me because it's even related to my reflection, the reflection that I had just this morning, reading about this anniversary. Because mm -hmm. my thought was, oh, it's, well, it was a great novel indeed. And I know the context, but God, I can't remember the novel actually. So in some sense, I do remember the novel in yes. this structural sense. And this is really fascinating. Thank you for that. Yes, yes. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, are you still good with time? Uh, yeah, sure. I know it, we have already talked for about an hour. So maybe it's I can... my fault. Uh, no, 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 no. I just want to make sure I have, I'm completely, I'm, I'm completely open to continuing as long as you are. I noticed your, I, I recently interviewed um, Russell Meyer and Nick Brancasio about their paper on uh, two types of an activist and activist movements they distinguish the so-called utopian from the scientific and uh, your you have a commentary uh, on that target article titled the centrality of enactment on where the ontological revolution starts and why nobody knows where its scientific application ends so you remind us in this commentary of the ontological task or tasks of uh, the philosophical side of an activism um maybe we can touch on that a little bit i also i'm curious about how you would identify how would you you would describe the promising relatively promising and relatively unpromising directions in 
current and activist work um, or the 4E cognition more generally? Because many people talk about them, but you know, they're different. The talks are, they have, they're not all the same quality <laughs> to put it mildly. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, it, it is a really great paper uh, and a great interview, by the way, as well. It was very mm -hmm. interesting. Um, so I think that this paper is really needed right now well, when we are, let's say, well, something like 30 years from the publication, even more than 30 years from the, the year of the publication of Varela's book, uh, The Embodied Mind, uh, Varela, Thompson and Roche. And so this is a good moment to, to ask ourselves, what have we accomplished actually? And what kind of accomplishment it is, if there is any. And, and, and so I believe that this paper, <clears throat> this paper should be uh, really one of the things right now, uh, one of the most discussed things right now uh, in the 4E camp, so to speak, mm -hmm. very broadly construed. I mean, in an activism and about a cognition and situated cognition and all these strange terms, it should be really discussed. And now I don't feel competent to say what is promising and what is not. So I will dodge this question sure. uh, because it would be it would be too much to give any any specific, you know, that this is good stuff. And, and it's this too risky. Is one, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't want to Actually, that. it's risky. You're right. You're perfectly right. It's risky politically, but uh, also I don't know. I really, I honestly have no idea because I don't have an overview of the whole tent, the whole 4E paradigm uh, in my head right now available. I can imagine having, let's say, a more specific position when it comes to this idea or that idea but uh we would have to go through the whole list so i don't think that it's 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 uh, it it is it would be that interesting but the general message of this commentary was that putting aside because i'm not a specialist the the, the question of what we have already accomplished when it comes to the scientific part of an activism I would like to deliver the message in this commentary that there is a profound philosophical uh, aspect of an activism or embodied cognition more broadly and ontological aspect in particular. So what it means, well, articulating what it means requires, uh, let's say, a kind of introduction to what ontology is really about. And so it would take too much time, but the general idea in my understanding and the understanding of the school that I was brought up in, let's say philosophically, is that, well, we all use concepts, even if these concepts in ordinary speech, as well as in, 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 in science, even if they are transparent, they are still there and they somehow condition our the way in which we see the world, the way in which we investigate the world, and so on and so forth. So we have these conceptual uh, frameworks, conceptual webs or nets. Um, and now in these conceptual uh, networks, there are certain structures that are they connect different conceptual frameworks of different sciences, for example, like certain concepts connecting the, the social sciences and the biological sciences. And there are certain concepts used in many different fields of, of, of research. So there is a certain structure of abstractness and generality in our cognitive, in our uh, conceptual frameworks. And the must, well, the, perhaps not must, but I believe as a philosopher, I believe there should be someone who is focused on these general notions, on these most general concepts. So for example, you have you can have uh, uh, various kinds of processes 
uh, investigated by the social sciences or by chemistry on the other hand. So you have process here and process there. And the question is, okay, so what is a process as such? Or a relation or an event uh, and so on and so forth. And this is what ontology is basically all about. Take these scaffolds, let's say, on which our conceptual frameworks are hanged, metaphorically put. They are like these scaffolds and investigate this. What are these conceptual scaffolds of our conditioning in one way or another, the way in which we perceive and investigate the world? So this is the job of especially applied ontologies like uh, what is usually called philosophy of biology, philosophy of perception, philosophy of psychology, philosophy of physics, and so on. So the philosophy of something. But mm -hmm. at the most general level, this is what ontology is all about, investigating these abstract concepts, which are supposed to somehow represent what we assume to be the categorical structure in reality itself, if we are realists, as I, as I said it earlier, I believe we don't have to be realist. We can say that this is all created by our cognition, but still, if it, even if it is created by our cognition, there are these scaffolds, conceptual scaffolds, even if they don't refer to any objective categorical reality in the Aristotelian sense of the term, there is still something to investigate. So that's why you can do ontology, even if you are, you are a radical constructivist in, in, in the sense of, of, the, of, this, of the great journal mm -hmm. um, with this title. So this is the job, let's say. And there is even, uh, there are even more general concepts, like the concept of being the most general concept that we can think of, that we can come up with, the concept of being which is the, the most abstract, and at the same time, it has zero content because mm -hmm. it does not discriminate anything from anything else because being, well, being, being is being, being, being is everything. So you don't draw any line by this concept. This is the most strange, the strangest concept that you can even, uh, that can pop up of, up of your head. But still, this is the one of the most traditional issues in, uh, ontology and metaphysics, the concept of being, the most general concept that you can think of. Uh, so this is the job, let's say. And now among these general concepts, there are certain concepts like concepts that function in pairs, like form and mother, like subjective, objective, okay? Um, actual potential from Aristotle, uh, also a different kind of pair, like thing and property. If you have a thing, it must have certain properties when you, you, you well, it's a matter of debate, but when you have a property when usually it belongs to a certain thing. So you have these pairs. And one of the pairs is uh, the distinction between something internal or external. And my, let's say, uh, one of the ideas that I'm really fixated on I've been fixated on for uh, a couple of years now, is this ontological structure imposed on our conceptualization of cognition, how we think of cognition. And now, it is quite striking, I must say, and it was a discovery for me personally at some point, that what seems to be the most obvious thing in the world, that cognition is about something internal having to do, uh, hopefully, with something external, okay? Cognition is happening in our heads, and what it is all about, it's about something that is happening outside of our heads. And I realized at some point, and not me actually, uh, many people who realized, and, 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 and I realized thanks to them, who so, uh, is one of the main inspirations here. They realized that this is just our conceptual, perhaps very natural, it comes natural, but it is a decision. It is not something necessary. It is not something given by a God or something or whatever. It is a decision. 
and basically we can even refer to the author of this decision and uh, the most important of this author is the god and given that his context uh, given the context of, of uh, the emergence of modern science and uh, given the physics of his time and so on and so forth, we can perfectly understand why he decided to conceptualize cognition in terms of this internal versus external dynamics. But this is not necessary. And if you, uh, if you look back toward certain philosophers and well, thinkers more generally before Descartes, uh, what they were doing, their approach was quite different. So for example, in Aristotle, everything is conceptualized in terms of actual and potential. So you have something actualized as a result of your cognition, like color, for example. It is potentially in the thing that you're perceiving, but you actualize this potential by perceiving it. It's a completely different vocabulary. It's a completely different ontology of cognition. Mm -hmm. And this was really striking when I realized that this is actually the case, that this distinction between the internal versus the external is a kind of ontological scaffold, which we take as so obvious and there are people actually right now who are trying to do something with this scaffold because according to them, the point is not that the scaffold is just wrong, but the idea in my understanding was and still is that this scaffold enabled many great thinkers to create scientific psychology, like for example, uh, all the classics, let's say, and uh, and 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 uh, cognitive science was actually born also based on this Cartesian ground and based on this ontology. But the the thing the the thought was, according to some people, that what we could accomplish, we have already accomplished, and now we need something more. We need a new ontology, and this was my reading of Varela. And this is not the language that Varela himself used, at least uh, to my knowledge. I guess that Sebastian Verus knows much more about this thing. Uh, but my understanding of Varela is that he was not an ontologist. He was not interested in ontology. But this was my reading of his work uh, and some other people as well. And this, is, this was a huge discovery for me personally when I realized that this may actually be an interesting way, I'm not saying the only way, but just an interesting way of reading an activism mm -hmm. as a proposition according to which we should right now try a different ontology of cognition. An ontology, whatever it might be, an ontology that is not based on the internal versus external dichotomy, but on something else. And here comes this controversial notion of an action or enactment, and nobody knows what it means. And I'm not supposed to explain what it means right now, but this is somehow supposed to replace the internal versus external dichotomy. And let me just add one thing. It's not about getting rid of the distinction, because it's a distinction. I mean, it's as good as any other distinction. It's perfectly fine. The computer that I'm right now faced with is not in my head. And my thought about this computer is not external. It's not there on my desk. On my desk is the real computer, not my thought. So the distinction is fine. It's great. But there is no necessity of taking this distinction as the most fundamental thing ever. You know what I mean? As the most fundamental ontological distinction that you can think of. It's just one of the distinctions. And when I realized that we can actually philosophize in this way, it was a huge discovery. 
And my whole research project in philosophy and this uh, monstrous thing I call ontological foundations of cognitive science, of uh, body cognition, actually, this project, this philosophical project, um, was a result of this discovery. Wow. And yeah. well, okay. coming back yeah. to the to the paper, my way of reading the paper was like, so now we have a problem of what we have accomplished with this whole inactivist thing. And what I wanted to stress is that, hey, people, there is something really fundamental philosophically in an activism and the scientific the scientific part, the scientific achievements, if any, is one thing. But even if there is no scientific achievement, there is at least not achievement right now, unfortunately, but a huge potential when it comes to the philosophical part. And so perhaps we should even focus more on the philosophical part, not because the scientific part is not promising enough, but perhaps we can come back to the scientific side when we order certain things on the philosophical side. Mm -hmm. I'm not that sure about uh, this, uh, this ordering, this logic, let's say, but perhaps we can also argue in this way. Well, anyway, my focus was on the philosophical side. And so I wanted to take part in this debate, in, this, in the discussion referring to this great paper from the purely philosophical perspective. There is something ontological in an activism and let's do some work to elicit this philosophical ontological thing in an activism. Mm -hmm. And I don't know to what extent I was successful in this commentary and in uh, other places, but, but I hope that sooner or later people, some people will join we join the project and we will come up with something more comprehensive because what I'm right now trying to articulate is, you know, just scattered thoughts uh, from uh, off the top of my head. But we should, as a community, philosophical community, we should sooner or later come up with something more comprehensive here because there is a real job to do. And even if it doesn't give us a stable new alternative, at least it frees us from the monopoly of that Cartesian legacy. Uh, because that, that quest towards foundationalism is one of its advantages for me. The, the advantage that stands out uh, in my mind is that it opens the path towards foundational pluralism, that it's possible to have a different grounding, that this this uh, the one that comes to us habitually, conventionally, is not the only possible one that we can yeah loosen our grasp, so to speak. Uh, yeah, I agree. Let's turn to your current project. You were very kind to send me a, a first chapter of your your book to be hopefully soon to be published, the footprints. Um, and in this work, you go through your you think through. A locative ontology, moving away from um, mind as a place or mind as a container metaphor towards mind in a place, uh, situated, located. And uh, it's really an exciting project. It's one of those occasions where I see a relation with the canon. You know, I we, we read Augustine, Descartes, the, the major thinkers of the past, but with with, with that interest in mind, we, we read through them uh, with this uh, locative ontology. So maybe we can, if you could say if, if some things about this, uh, this project, its motivation, and how it is an expression of that ontological concern. Yes, actually, it's the final, uh, the final product. Of, well, maybe not final, but... Uh, at least at this at this point, most recent, most recent, uh, most recent, and at this point, even I would even uh, risk a claim that this is mm -hmm. uh, at this particular stage of my uh, research is it, it is the final product of this ontological uh, investigation into an activism, okay. uh, and basically uh, this is part of the same story. I mean, 
the an activist literature is full of these references to locative categories like something is but not only the inactivist literature uh, but uh, the inactivist and the body cognition literature in particular so you can read that something is not uh, in our heads something is not in our minds something is in the environment or that the mind is extended consciousness is not out in our heads this kind of stuff and all these claims are supposed to say something important and i believe that they do say something important but my question is okay but we have these notions like being in it's by no means obvious what it means to be in it's not like parthood it's not uh, like being in a set in the uh, usual set theoretical sense of of the term uh, in a collection some being in a room is not being part of the room the room is not a, a, a is not a set it's actually an entity so there is this question of what being in actually means in general and there is uh, and locative ontology is focused on on this particular relationship generalized uh in the sense that not only about being in but about any locative relationship there is a literature about location uh and there are great philosophers like Achille Varzi and Barry Smith and Roberto Casati and and, and Peter Simons working on location boundaries and and these kind of things from a purely ontological perspective so this is one thing and on the other hand you have all these inactivists actually using this in or out or boundary terminology without any attention paid to what these things what these notions actually stand for so my idea in the simplest possible way expressed in the simplest possible way is to somehow take these things together and ask the question of what the inactivist mean in the ontological sense of the term by the locative terminology or when they use the locative terminology so what is the ontology of the relation of being in my mind or in the environment or i should say not the environment but an environment some environment what an environment is actually this is also a locative notion a very strange one and super interesting one very close to the notion of niche but not identical uh, we can say that niches are, are parts of bigger environments let's say but so these two notions are very related uh so what an environment is you have environment everywhere in this literature but you can hardly find any definition of an of an environment uh so my goal was to just uh, provide some sort of conceptual clarity if anyone is interested in conceptual clarity uh, and so this is the book and to do that to provide this at least some level of conceptual clarity you also need to recognize the inactivist movement against the background of traditional philosophy which includes in my case traditional metaphysics this is not a goal in and of itself to recognize an activism against this traditional metaphysical background but it's a means in in my case you need to at least provide some overview of philosophical traditions where certain things certain ideas come from in order to do your job and and and, and to clarify certain locative notions uh, or actually this refers i guess to many ontological projects that people can come up with in reference to an activism but the locative terminology was my project and and 
in order to realize this project and to come up with some results, I need to go uh, at least very briefly. And it is really brief, but uh, as I said, at least briefly uh, through philosophical traditions. So yeah, the book is ready and, 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 and we see what happens with the book. Whereas right now, when it comes to my current project, my current project is more related to issues having to do with social philosophy and this kind of stuff. So in this sense, this is not my, I mean, the book is not my current project, but the final result of what I've been working on for like 10 years or even more than that. Um, yeah. Excellent. And from my perspective, reading the book, it is, I went through a really like a exciting process reading it. And I'm, I can, for me, it's very generative. I'm me. I'm not even in academia anymore. I'm not even like looking to see how I can use it in my publications. It's relevant even to my personal life. It, it casts new light on my experiences of working at different positions, being in relation to different places, institutions, uh, communities, moving from place to place, both f literally, physically, and psychologically. I'm would, humbled. Yeah. You made my day. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's I'm, really I'm great. grateful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I'm grateful for your work. I, I can't wait for it to be published. And so I can hold it in my hand and read it. <laughs> and uh, same I goes I hope it for, will be. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, and I, I can imagine social uh, philosophy being an, an extension of that, a continuation in the next stage. I think it was uh, Milan Kondera who said in his uh, book, The Art of the Novel, that uh, to write a novel truly is to position oneself in the history of the novel. And that's, uh, you said something similar about to, to write a work of philosophy is to position oneself in the history of philosophy. It's not enough to just see what the embodied and activist philosophers are saying. It has to be in the, con in the larger context of what came before, what, is it, what is, they are responding to, or the movements, the movement of thought over time and uh, the dialectical process. Without it, it's just... Um, I don't know. And Kundera talks about the failure to 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 be to to join that history mostly due to lack of reading the canon or reading canonically. Yeah, you're right. I mean, one thing that came to my mind is that what is specific about philosophy is that it's different from the history of philosophy. I mean, doing philosophy is not doing the history of philosophy. And it's not that obvious to many people, by the way. But nonetheless, philosophy is, as I like to put it, a, a, a history-sensitive discipline, which is not the case in when it comes to, I don't know, physics or something like that. Uh, they just don't care and they don't have to care about the history of their own discipline. Uh, so this is just these criteria of success. The criteria of success are such that they can and, uh, uh, ignore the history of their own discipline. Although I believe that many great uh, uh, scientists know the history, but they don't have to know the history. Whereas when it comes to philosophy, despite the fact that I would really draw a quite strict line between history of philosophy and philosophy proper, nonetheless, this quality of being history sensitive, so to speak, is really crucial because this is your source of inspiration. This is your source of actual, I don't know, food for thought. I don't know how to put it, not metaphorically, but I guess you know perfectly what I mean. We could almost think of it as a semi-permeable like membrane like things can cross from one direction to the other but not the other side mm -hmm. to be to be a philosopher it's necessary to know the history of philosophy but if you just know the history of philosophy you're not in the in the domain of philosophy yet yeah you, yeah you might be right yes it's a nice nice uh comparison let's say to the structure of the cell yeah well, why not Dr. Werner, thank you so much for your time. It was a 
Great Thank pleasure you. meeting you. Uh, My I hope pleasure. We, have, we have more conversations with uh, Sebastian uh, Boris. We talked about the possibility of maybe uh, creating a little group discussion about yeah. other topics when, uh, when time permits. But in the meantime, thanks again. And uh, let me pause the recording. And Thank you.